computer. Okay, we are recording and we are live on Facebook, on Las Vegas Tri Club Facebook page. And today we're gonna to do another sports science video conversation. And today I have the pleasure of talking with co-host uh, Ted Gerard. Hi Ted, how's it going? Good, yeah, really good. I'm kind of excited to talk about this uh, topic because you know a few weeks ago in our one of our chats, uh, one of the coaches mentioned glute activation, and I think a lot of people were confused on exactly what that is and you know how your glutes could potentially be limiting you. So I was really excited to put together this talk, and uh, I actually did this talk for my class last week, and they really liked it. And so uh, I figured it'd be a good chance to to share this with the with the club as well. Awesome. No, I, I think so, and yeah, I. I I know I was confused during that presentation in terms of what glute activation was. And uh, then uh, later on when my wife and I were talking about it, she was saying, well, this is what it looks like. I'm like, oh, that, I, that wasn't even in what I had envisioned. So I'm, I'm ready to learn here. So tell right. me about uh, glute activation. So I'm going to share my screen because basically I have a PowerPoint presentation going with it. And then uh, once again, if you guys have questions, if people on either Facebook or on the live feed on Zoom, uh, go ahead and just type those in, and uh, John will uh, break in and uh, ask the questions as we as we go. All right, so I'm going to share my screen here. And are you able to see that now? Yes. Okay. And there we go. Okay, so here's our outline for today. We are going to talk about the glute muscles, uh, a little bit about what they are. Um, we'll talk about the running gait and the glute relationship between the running gait. And then we'll get into some fun stuff with some practical applications. We're actually have some good videos of um, some of the exercises that you could uh, potentially try. Okay, so uh, our major glute muscles, we have the gluteus maximus, which is the largest muscle in the body and it's pictured here. Um, it's interesting because it actually supports the knee when the leg is extended. And think of your leg extender, knee, uh, knee and leg extender as your leg out in front of you. And then it stabilizes, it's a stabilizer of the trunk against flexion of the trunk. So think about like leaning forward or falling forward. It's, you know, your glutes will actually stabilize you as you do that. Or uh, your gluteus maximus, sorry. Uh, then we have a gluteus medius. The gluteus medius is kind of the next layer down. We'll show you a couple more uh, pictures of these. Um, this assists with pelvic and, and femur stability, as well as a, a, a hip. It's a hip abductor, so it has your allows your leg to come out from the side of your body, and also is a little bit of an internal and external rotator. And then your gluteus medius, which is the next level down. And that also assists with pelvic stability. So one of the things you can actually see when we just in, in briefly talk about these things, we have stabilization, stability, and stability. And truly, that's what we're trying to, main, to maintain uh, when we think about glute activation. So I got a little video here. So just to explain uh, the, the movements. Oh, hang on a second. So the first movement we're talking about is hip abduction. So I made mention of that already. So that's the, that's the leg moving out to the side. Okay, so we can see it here. Um, obviously in sports like uh, triathlon, we really don't do this movement much, but our body is always counterbalancing against this movement. And it's something that kind of intrinsically happens um, from, uh, from within. So right now we can actually start to see the highlighting of one of these muscles. So we have the, 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 um, the gluteus medius being highlighted right now. And um, you can actually see it's starting to come in, in a little bit um, of a deeper color there. Okay, so we basically have the three layers. So gluteus medius, gluteus, sorry, gluteus minimus, gluteus medius, and gluteus maximus. And they all do these, this movement, okay? The next movement we we're gonna talk about is hip external rotation. So think about this in, the fact that if your knee was bent or your knee is straight, it is the, the, if you think about your femur, it's the external rotation or the outward rotation of your femur. And in this case, it's mostly gluteus maximus that we have highlighted here, but also gluteus medius will, will play a role in this as well. Now, if we think about uh, a sport like triathlon or running, um, again, not a movement that we do, but because it's also a stabilizer, and it's a, it's a movement that ultimately um, we're trying to protect against, of all things. 
um, or sorry, not, not against, but we're trying to help have it work with us rather than against us. I guess that's a, a good way to put it. And then the other movement, and this one is the one we tend to think about when we think about glute activation and running is hip extension. So we can see here the, the gluteus maximus firing and contracting to bring, to drive our femur backwards. And the truth of the matter is when we run or we cycle, if our gluteus maximus in particular is not activated, which we're going to talk about um, at length, then we will not be propelling ourselves as efficiently as possible. And we potentially will be using other musculature to do the same thing. And um, oftentimes these muscles, all of them actually end up being inhibited. And we'll talk about why that happens. Okay, so when we talk about running and the glutes. So the first thing to understand is the glute muscles are the power muscles for running. When used properly, they propel the body forward through hip extension. There's kind of a, a round about way to think about it. They increase, uh, increasing glutes increases speed, increasing glutes increases speed, increasing speed increases glutes. And um, we, it's just a circle that keeps going over and over again. And if we don't utilize them properly, or once again, they're not activated properly, we will not be able to get to our full potential. And then there's actually more downsides to it uh, as well. And we'll start talking about some of the injuries associated with this as well. Okay, so I'm gonna share with you a little video here. And I know the video sometimes is a little choppy on Zoom, but we'll be able to go kind of frame by frame. So this is an ITU uh, triathlon. And in this frame, we actually have, probably in the last three or four years, maybe three years, we have two of the best triathletes in the world that are females. So we have Flora Duffy here and we have Katie Severus here. Okay. What I want you to pay attention to is Flora Duffy. So with the red top and the navy bottom. And I know it is a little choppy, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to pause it, maybe. Okay, so what I want you to look at is I want you to look at the level of her hips as we go stride by stride. And just look how level her waist is. Every step is almost perfect. And then look at them as she actually, as we get a little bit further, as she comes by us, we're actually going to be able to see her glutes kind of firing as she extends. So let's look at her right foot here. As she hits, well, let's go back. As she hits, right as she hits, her glutes start to fire. And what I look for is now on the opposite foot. So on the, on the foot that's in the air, so on the left foot here, there's no drop in her hip. That tells me that her glutes are activated as, she, as she's running. Now, this is an interesting frame because if we, if, oh, sorry, I wish I could do this a little bit slower. Um, that's right, actually, this is good because uh, this is not what I look like. And, yeah. and it's funny, I'm glad you're pointing this out because I, I had not noticed that uh, in this video. And so this, that's really good to see. Yeah, and, and it's an easy way to see, especially if you look at people near the end of races and as they fatigue, that's when you start to see that hip drop. And actually, we're going to go a little bit further forward here. As she makes this pass, you can start to see the power coming from her glute. Like, look at the look at her right side, and look at the musculature as she as she extends back, and how much she extends back. There's there's her full ex, full hip extension, and that's another thing that's really lacking when you don't have proper glute activation. They you don't get that full extension of the hip in the air. I'm just gonna I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna play this because it's, it's only about 20 seconds. And you tell me, John, can we see it okay? Or is it a little choppy? Yeah, no, that's good. It's a little choppy, but it's, it's, it, you can see it. Okay, and then I actually have another video of her. Oh, it's the next. And Flora Duffy is one of the top runners. Uh, yeah, and, and, and well, and Katie Zavaris, the girl that she just passed there, yeah. is, is also one of the best runners. Okay, so that's kind of a little bit of the point is that um, there, it's subtle, subtle things. And, and uh, Kate Zavaris has actually become a better runner since that, that video is a couple of years old since then. And one of the things that she's done, I was reading about it, is done a lot of glute activation. Work. So what we look for is um, a point where we have sta stability and mobility. So it's kind of tricky, right? You have to have both. If you are too stable, you're not going to have 
good enough motion to actually to run efficiently. But you have, so you have to have this balance between stability and mobility and where the stability is versus where the mobility is, is, is important. Okay. So if we, if we really look at, if we look at this guy and we can see, look at him now where his weight is now all the way driven over to the right and his leg is crossing and he's, he's actually, uh, this is, uh, he's kind of drifting across here. So he's actually got decent mobility, but poor stability. So ultimately, when we think about this, the, the, the pelvic girdle is truly a multi-directional um, thing. So it's, it's, it's moving side to side, it's rotating around and around, and it's rotating this way, right? So front and back or fore and aft. And we, what we need to do is we want it to be, a, we want it to be stable, but also move appropriately. And good glute activation will allow this to happen. And ultimately, this will help protect the knee. And that's, that's it's, it's actually two pronged here, right? We want to increase performance, but we also don't want to get injured, right? And, and there really is, um, there is a balance there. And one of the things you have to do when we, when we start to do this is you need to earn, um, you need to earn speed, right? We can be fast for a short amount of time, but get injured right? But ultimately what we have to do with to earn speed and we earn that by earning it through stability and appropriate mobility, which we'll get uh, more into. Okay. And I, so I have another video here. So this is actually me running. And uh, there's something called a valgus knee, which I'll explain and hip adduction, which I'll explain. So um, there's also a guest on this one. It's Cosmo, my dog. He's watching me. <laughs> Okay, so I paused myself here. So this, if you draw a line from my hip here to my knee here, and then another line from my knee to my foot, you'll notice there's an angle here. This is called a valgus knee, okay? So this is a very, very common thing to have happen. If, and can you guys, can you see my pointer? Yes, yes. Okay. Yep. So if I'm weak here on the outside of my thigh, or I'm not, um, uh, I'm not, uh, or I'm fatigued on the outside of my thigh, you're going to see this happen and this will cause a collapse in my knee. Okay. That ultimately will cause knee problems, including for example, uh, patella femoral issues or kneecap pain. And if I take it even a step further, it'll cause foot problems. So ultimately what happens here when, when this happens, this collapse happens. And if this was a more of a three dimensional thing, we'd also notice that my femur or my thigh is also rotating inward. And as that happens, it creates a rotation that goes down into my lower leg. And if I actually play this a little bit further, maybe even to the next step, uh, let's go to the next step. Uh, it works better on this one. I'm okay. actually- Can, can I uh, I'll yeah. just ask, are you yeah. trying to run this way? I am trying to run this way. Okay. Because this is I, not, I, this is not my normal run. But I was going to say, if people don't know, you're one of our top runners in uh, triathlon uh, locally. I mean, you run uh, a half Ironman in what, 120, what? Well, I think my best is 123, but. 123, okay. Maybe 127 on a good day these days, but. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's phenomenal. So, okay, that's what I, I was I'm hoping actually, you were going to say you were running like this on purpose. All right. What I wanted to add, though, is that rotation, it actually gets projected down through my knee and into my foot. And what it'll also do is it'll create excessive pronation. Mm -hmm. So that rotation actually continues down. It actually starts in my hip, rotates through my femur, through my tibia, and into my foot, creating an actual pronation of the foot. Now, what people often do when they're over pronators, they go to a running store, or they'll have a running analysis, then, oh, you're an over pronator. So you know what we need to do is we need to put an arch support in your foot, or we need to put a stability shoe on you. Mm -hmm. And what that will do is it'll correct the pronation, but ultimately all it's doing is creating a block to this problem when the, really the issue is in the hip. And if we correct the hip, we can help correct the foot issues. Okay, so this is all multifaceted, right? So we're not necessarily always talking about performance, we're talking about, um, we're talking about injury as well. 
And then even if I over pronate while I'm running um, or I have excessive movement here, it's actually going to take more energy and I'll be less of efficient of a runner. So I'll just play this, play this through. And it's not easy for me to do that run. <laughs> no, yeah. Okay, then we have another one that's called the crossover gait. So the first one, and actually I'll just pause this again. The first one was caused by hip abduction and a rotation. This one is called, caused by just, uh, sorry, by hip adduction and uh, rotation. This one is just hip adduction. So now watch this as I, as I cross over. Oh, these videos are tough on PowerPoint. So on this one, I'm actually crossing over. And I think it's maybe confusing for, for people what hip abduction and abduction is. So I'll pause that again there. So adduction is the foot and leg coming across the body in to the inside. Abduction or abduction would be coming out. So you can see on this step here, how my foot is crossing over now, right? So my center of gravity is here and the center of my foot now is across that. That's a crossover gait. And that is also caused by weakness in the glute. This would be on this side, okay? Which would be allowing that to happen. And once again, this will create patella issues and foot issues, um, even uh, potentially injury to the outside of the foot on this case, because of excessive wear on the outside of the foot. And then it'll create almost a slapping down of the foot uh, on the inside, once again, leading to um, uh, maybe potentially over pronation. Now, if we have, oh, and we do have a running coach on here. So Angelina is on here. Um, a crossover gait can also be really fast. Okay. But a crossover gait needs to be earned. And it could take years and years and years to earn it. And you earn it because you actually can earn it by um, having really, really, really stable hips. I cannot run a crossover gait um, at this point. Like it, I just, as soon as I start doing it, I get problems. I get knee issues. I get foot, foot issues. So years and years and years of work, you could potentially live with a crossover gait. But for the for most people, it's something that we probably do need to correct. And once again, this is not something necessarily you can correct by just saying, okay, I'm not going to run crossover unless you have the stability in the hip to keep it from coming across. It'll want to come across. Okay, so are you doing this for the, this video, this running here for the purposes of this session or were you doing this as a running drill? No, no, this was, this was done to be shown that it's done wrong. Okay, all right. But you're not doing it as a running drill. This isn't no. something you're trying to. No, this is something okay. that I'm just trying to show wrong. And then, oh, sorry. I will show you on the last run I do. So it'll be one more run, and this will be the, the last run will be me running normally. Oswald's not impressed. No, he's tied up. <laughs> so that was a wide, stable gait on that one. And you can see I'm, I'm very square. There's no crossover. And it's stable. Now, the thing is with me, if I look at the way I run and at the end of a race, I'm not running like this. I'm collapsing and I'm, I'm basically falling apart. And because I, you know, I don't have enough stability. I, just, I haven't built it up to do like a half marathon or a marathon um, with good enough form yet. And I've been working on it for years, but that's just, that's part of the game. Here it is in slow motion. Okay, so now let's look at Flora Duffy again. And we're going to look at her in, uh, from a front view. And the one thing you'll notice is she actually has a little bit of a crossover gait, but she's earned it, right? And you can, you'll notice when she crosses over how stable her hips are. Mm -hmm. And she's crossing over a little bit. But the stability is just unbelievable. Okay, and we think about that. This is after she's already, this is an Olympic race and this is near the end of it, right? Where she's gonna go like 205 or something ridiculous and, and run a 35 minute 10K off of the bike and still 
very, very stable. So this is what we want to, you know, this is what we want to aim for with, with, what we're with what we're talking about. Okay, so when we think about running in glutes, the other thing, actually, sorry, the one other thing I want to add is the glutes also play a huge role in cycling. Um, and so doing this work will also help with cycling. I just happened to, to, to talk about running. Okay, so um, when we run, uh, really hip extension is our dominant exercise. That's where we get our propulsion from. So that is the pulling back of, of the femur. Now in life, uh, I'm looking in the cameras, uh, most people are sitting, right? So we're sitting and when we're sitting, we're in this hip flexion all the time. And that becomes our dominant position or our dominant activity. So if you think about it, if you had a job where you're walking around all day, you may not have so much of this, uh, of this issue. So what we want to have is this ultimately this neutral pelvis, which most of us have is this anterior tilted pelvis. And, and it's caused because, mostly because of sitting uh, all day. And now if we actually think about it, we tra translate it to cycling. If we're in a time trial position all day, we're probably setting ourselves up to be more like this as well. So we need to counterbalance that with uh, some of the exercises we do. So if you think about it, when we're sitting around all day, we're going to have short and tight in the front, long and weak in the back. And we're talking about the hamstrings here, quadriceps here, long and weak here in our ab, short and tight in our back. Okay. That, that ultimately creates this. So if you, if you were to see nothing else, but to look at this, how could we correct this? Well, one of the things we could probably not do, and, and I don't want to ever be an advocate for this and just in general is spend a lot of time, for example, stretching our hamstrings. Chances are they're already, they're already long and potentially weak. If we're going to stretch something, we might consider stretching this. Although I'm not really a big, honestly, a big fan of doing too much stretching. I'm more of a fan of activation. So we want to activate this posterior side here. Um, it's actually really interesting. I had the for fortune of uh, listening to one of the athletic therapists who works with Cirque du Soleil last night. He was giving a presentation and he was actually talking about um, their low back injuries and how they've mitigated their low back injuries by actually correcting this balance between uh, the, 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 the anterior and the posterior. And we'll, once again, we'll talk more about that. Because um, what we're ultimately creating is muscle weaknesses and imbalance. So we have imbalances from front to back and also potentially right to left. Although we don't see a lot of right to left in runners and cyclists, in some sports we'll see more of it. Think more like a soccer player, there might be a lot more right or left dominant. Um, but what we will see is once again, tightness in the anterior hips and weakness in the posterior hips or the posterior chain. So you may hear the term posterior chain. So in blue is our posterior chain and we have a couple of different um, levels or layers to this. So this is the, these are both the typical um, posterior chain. So this one is our, uh, our, our calf muscles, our hamstrings going up into the deep extensors of the back and spine. And then this one is our glutes coming across into our lats. Okay, and these are all connected via fascial, uh, fascial layers. And they do absolutely play a role with each other. And when we have stability in the, in the posterior chain and strength in the posterior chain, it will absolutely uh, help us uh, become better runners, but also have less overuse injuries, which I think that we all uh, would agree that would be a good thing. So uh, signs of weak glutes and what we can look for. So the number one sign for weak glutes is some knee pain. And it can be a, just a simple, something as simple as, you know, when I run, my knees kind of feel like a little bit of pain. I'm not saying like the kind of knee pain that is, you know, um, associated with like long-term osteoarthritis or something like that. But just, you know, my knees are sore when I run. First thing I always look for is their glutes and look for glute, uh, glute weakness. Uh, faulty mechanics. So um, very simple things like uh, the knees basically coming forward too much uh, in, in, in our run. Um, it's a, it's a tough thing to see, but if we video it, we can see that. Uh, a bigger one is the knee valgus, where the knee's coming in. Um, lack of something called hip hinge. So lack of, um, a, a basically, of just basic movement from, from the uh, flex position to the extended position. Um, and then a difficulty in pushing the knees out or holding, uh, holding that more uh, 
I guess it's almost an outward pointing of the, of the kneecaps or a forward pointing of the kneecap. Um, another one is lack of soreness after training. And what I mean by that is if someone does a hard running session, they should, especially if, if, they're, if they're really pushing themselves, where are they sore? So if they're sore, for example, in the hamstrings, then the hamstrings are being more active than the glutes. We know that the glutes are more important. So we, we look for that and where are they sore? Or if they're really sore in their quads after running, and they're being, they're, they potentially are running too quad dominant, they should have some soreness and tightness in their glutes after they finished a hard session. Uh, weak ankles and feet, um, and that's usually associated with excessive pronation. Um, we can look at that while they run or while they squat. And once again, pronation is that if your foot is neutral like this, it, and these are the inside of the big toes, it's that coming down. So you think about it like a fallen arch or a, flat, a flattening of the foot. Uh, we can also look for uh, their hip flexors being tight. Um, and then I mentioned the hip drop, so the side to side hip drop uh, when, they, uh, when they're running. So we can look at this and we can also look at like overuse injuries. So some very, very common ones. So IT band syndrome, a lot of runners have this. I've had this to the point where you know, I've had to pull out of several races. Um, one of the things that we look for when people have IT band issues is weakness in the, in the glutes and in particular gluteus maximus. So 80% of gluteus maximus actually attaches to the IT band and helps stabilize it and control it. Um, also, that ex it, we see excessive knee valgus and, and potentially hip rotation, that hip internal rotation. Uh, strong glutes help protect uh, from that. Uh, hamstring issues. I made mention to it already as well, that if the hamstrings are sore, then the glutes might not be doing a good job of firing and we're actually ultimately using the hips instead, and, or so the hamstrings instead. And it's important to know that the hamstrings also do hip extension. They just don't do it as well as the glutes do. And when the glutes are weak, the hamstrings will take over. Other ones, uh, shin splints. Um, believe it or not, shin splints, even though shin splints are mostly caused uh, by basically ramping up our program too quickly, uh, if someone has not ramped up too quickly and they're having shin problems, we can look at stability of the pelvis and or the feet. The big one is actually patellofemoral pathology, uh, also known as runner's knee. That's just pain underneath the kneecap. And we see this uh, in the literature, actually, it's a delayed activation of, of the gluteus medius, which ultimately causes that hip uh, adduction or crossover gait, uh, which will create greater stress on the patellofemoral joint. And then low back pain, also very much associated with, uh, with lack of glute activation and weak posterior chain muscles. Okay, so uh, how to work and activate the glutes. So this is where the, the rubber meets the road, as it were. So the, the idea here is we don't necessarily want to be doing these as like super heavy weighted exercises. We can do that, okay, but not necessarily associated with activating our glutes for running. So we can become stronger and we absolutely should and we can do, there's lots and lots, you go on the internet, there's lots and lots of glute strengthening ex exercises we can do. And I completely think that that's something that we should add into our, uh, our weekly program, maybe one or two times a week doing heavy lifting. But this, what we're talking about is getting our body used to doing these moves or having the glutes activated. Um, so, it, you know, it doesn't, once again, it doesn't mean you shouldn't perform weighted exercises, but in this context, we don't have to. The other thing is we're going to use a variety of exercises because the body we know works really, really well when we give it different stimuli. And as runners and things specifically about runners, a lot of times runners just run and they're not giving themselves enough variety. So how often should we do this? Um, when you read into the literature on this, we should probably be doing it before training. And if we're really trying to make uh, significant gains during training, so what I like to do is um, perform about three glute exercises, and I'm gonna give you a thing nine or 10, uh, before I run or before I bike ride. Then about halfway through the run, do one or two more, and then that's it. And just continually do that. Um, we don't have to do it a lot of it, just enough to get it kind of going. So I noticed like for me, I, I, I do have knee pain when I run 
and you know maybe four or five miles in stop do a few glute exercises kind of resets myself and it's amazing the pain decreases and my body starts to recognize that the glutes are there and starts to utilize them more we'll talk about some other things about like kind of thinking your way through these at the very end but ultimately these are some some good uh takeaways for this um and then also uh how many to do so um you can see it says 15 sets uh over several workouts so let's say you're going to run three times a week four times a week it would just be you know three or four sets of these um per day or per run so it's not like we're not doing a tremendous amount about it uh, of these things just enough to once again wake these things up so i'm gonna once again i'm gonna show you now some videos um there's some tools that are associated with these things and I understand like you're not necessarily going to have these things with you when you run, but it's amazing. You can find things out in nature that you can use. So the first one is just a single leg step up. So this is just a, a 12 inch step. When I'm out running, oftentimes I'm starting to look for, Oh, is there a couple uh, of like little bricks on the side of a, like a, a wall or something like that I can use just something out there. Uh, you can go higher than this. I'll use a park bench sometimes just, to, this is just once again, to get myself kind of fired up. So, it's pretty simple, one leg up, one leg down. I lift this foot up. I, I find that if we lift that foot up, we can kind of stimu stimulate the glute even more. And once again, I'm really thinking about firing from the glutes. So here's the side view. And how many do you usually do? I just do like 10, that's it. Yep. But and then I'm, and then I'm gonna move to the next exercise. It's not about like doing three sets of 10. I'm not going for strength here. I'm just basically, think about it, you're trying to wake the muscle uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so this one's called uh, a single leg ru a Romanian deadlift, but I'm not doing it with any weight. Normally a deadlift would be done with a lot of weight. So I love this one when I'm running because I can find somewhere to put my foot up quite easily. And all I'm doing is I'm bending forward and bending up. Mm. And if you look at this position, as I go down, I'm actually leaning forward. Now, um, I have some uh, students in my class that they saw, oh, your form is horrible. Mm -hmm. And I said, ah, yeah, but I'm not doing a weighted room. Oh. Hold on, Ted, we're losing you. Oh, are you losing me? Yeah, okay, now you're back. Okay, so I'm actually trying to lean forward here because the more I lean forward, the more glute activation I'm getting. And because I'm not loaded with, let's say, 60 pounds of weight, like maybe in the gym, I'm not concerned about my spine here being damaged, I'm really doing it to, to initiate the glutes to, to fire. The other comment that some of my students had was, oh, your shin should be uh, straight up and down. Well, not necessarily because in running, we also want um, the tibia to, to translate a little bit forward. So this is actually good technique. Uh, so you're, you're trying to go over your foot with your shoulders. Exactly. And how deep are you usually going? I'm going, oh, sorry on that one. I'm going to 90 degrees. 90 degrees of the front leg? Of the yeah of knee flexion okay. so right. right there so basically 90 degrees okay. yeah perfect okay the next one is just a banded kickback and it's interesting a lot of times i'll run with a band in my pocket mm. so i just have this simple band in my pocket doesn't take up any room i can stop i can do this very very simply this one actually kind of gets the hamstring as well as the glute and if i want more glute on this one i can bend my knee more and then the other thing I can do is I can actually take this foot and externally rotate it a little bit as I do this or, or bring it out towards the camera a little bit more. And I can change where the glute activation actually is with this one. I really like uh, this kickback. And once again, I'm, you put that I'm, in your pocket and run with it. I'm doing like 10 of these. It's not, it's, you know, 10 on each leg takes a minute. Even by the time I like put the band on about a minute. And there's a few, there's another drill we're going to use this uh, a couple of other drills we'll use the the band for. All right. And you're do this halfway through your run. Yep. Yep. Or like I said, I'll do it. Be, maybe I'll I'll do it. That time I'll do it before I run. The next time I'll do it halfway through. Okay. Yeah. All right. The speed skater. Oh, I think this is the one. I maybe I messed up on. Nope. This is a good one. So this, I'm really trying to drive nice and hard all the way across. 
and you'll notice my foot, see that back foot, how it just taps. And I'm using that leg and this leg to drive. So the, so the right leg and left leg are both being activated here. This is a, one, of the, one of the best exercises there is for glute activation. Mm. And it's, it's harder than it looks to maintain stability. Yeah. No, I think of that slide and glide, but yeah, that's great. When I'm tired, so if I've ridden, ran like five miles and I do that one, I'm like, I'm a mess. Mm. Like I'm an absolute, I, I might even fall over. Um, and it's, it's, just, but that goes to show how much we do fatigue when we, when we actually are running. Um, my band again. So this is a banded sidestep and notice the band is around my toes. And I just go back and forth. So this is similar to the speed skater. It actually works just a little bit different and it's around my toes because my, my, uh, glutes, uh, are external, or my gluteus maximus are external hip rotators. And so this is going to stimulate them even more. I could do that one. If you put it around your knees, you don't get the same, uh, or, or even your ankles, you don't get the same um, uh, protuberance, I guess the word would be, of your, uh, of your glutes. You may have seen this one before. This is a clamshell. Pretty simple. This one, so it's around my knees. And... Once again, just I have my feet stacked here and I'm just lifting one leg up, bringing it down under control. This one's interesting too, because on this one, um, it looks relatively easy. And when you're fresh, it's very easy. I could do like 50 or 60 of these. If I was fresh, I wouldn't want to, I could, but when I'm tired, it's amazing how few you can do. And this goes right into, I usually do these ones together since the band is easy to, to move. And I apologize to that lady sitting there. I tried to reserve the whole park, but they wouldn't let me. And so uh, you you run how many times a week? Uh, three or four. And then how many times are you doing this? Three or four. Okay. I try and do it every run. Yeah. I'd like to start doing it more cycling, at least for the warm up of my cycling. Mm -hmm. I just feel it, it, when I'm doing these consistently is when I feel the best. So that sideline abduction, like I said, I just, I do that with the clamshells. I'll do, let's say 10 of that, 10 of, 10 of the sideline abduction and I'm good. Mm -hmm. And because it's the same band, it's, it's relatively easy to do. Mm -hmm. um, this one actually has a little weight on it. So I usually only do this when I'm at, at home and, I, and you don't have to do it with a weight, but I just don't find it really activates unless I use a weight. And you've probably seen this before, but just lifting up. And this is this is a uh, three pound weight. It's I mean once again it's not it's not much. It's just enough for me to to start to feel that. Once again, you do not have to do that one with the weight. Okay, um, so it's called forward backwards lunge. So this is on the same foot. I'm gonna do a forward lunge, then a backwards lunge, and just back and forth. And I try and make it as rhythmical as possible. This is working in this case the right leg. This is working the right leg and the left leg. Okay. And once again, I do like 10 on the right, 10 on the left. That's all I would do. And once again, the key is to just keep mixing it up. What I probably should do is keep a little Excel sheet, to be honest with you, with a little check mark. So make sure I get, you know, them at least all two times during the week. That's a, probably what I should do. Okay. So now uh, we're going to a few more videos. It actually started to. So I really ran like five miles and I do that one. I am like, I'm a mess. Yeah. I'm an absolute, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, but we want to get to the point where we build up enough resilience that we're not a mess when we do this. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you can see we moved to locations. It's the, the they, they turned the sprinklers on, on me. So I had to, I had to move locations. So, um, the next one is single leg glute bridge. Once again, we can do this pretty much anywhere. And we're, we're just going up and down and just one leg. And this one really does work the glutes nice. Gets a, gets a good activation. Once again, none of these exercises are difficult when you're fresh.
And sometimes when you're running, it feels good to lay down just for a second. <laughs> I know that you're still, you're still doing something productive. All right, next one, the airplane. Okay, now I gotta be honest with you. I've just started doing this a couple months ago and uh, I'm still not a master of this. And this is fresh, um, but this is actually maybe my new favorite. So I'll play it and you can see it's how tough, it's, it's super tough to do. So I'm trying to actually just tap my finger to the ground. And if I was really good, I'd actually rotate back towards the camera a little bit more. Oh, such a struggle. But honestly, one of my absolute favorite new exercises I've, I've come across. And I think we have one more. And this is very simple. Muted now. I muted myself. How did I un how do I unmute? Oh, I'm not muted. Okay. Um, so this oh, is sorry, I had a bit of a technical thing. I, I actually muted you for a second, but you're okay. Good. Sorry about that. So this is the last one. This is called a hip hiker. And all I'm doing is I'm just trying to bring this, this hip up and down as high as I can. And you can see I'm struggling with this. Mind you, I've done all of these exercises in a row, which I normally wouldn't do. And I'm just trying to get as much movement as I can on this, uh, on the hip that was on the ground. I'll show you that one one more time, kind of halfway through. So you're trying to just move laterally? Uh, actually, I'm trying to get this hip up and down as high as I can. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it's a t right. it's it's honestly when you're a little fatigued, it's really hard. Okay, but that's that motion when we're running that's going to maintain level across uh, across the across the waist. Okay, next one. That was the end of the exercise. So now the other thing we can do is we can try activation while running. So this is something that um, I work on a lot as well. Is that once you learn and once you start to feel your glutes, you can actually start to run like this. Okay. So I set an alarm. Um, I, try, I, I maybe every quarter mile. Sometimes I'll do every half a mile. I actually, you know, run in kilometers because I'm, I'm that's how I am. So I do it every half a kilometer. I have a little alarm go off, and that just refocuses me to to tell me to start to think about what I'm doing. So for me, uh, my my things I like to do is. Um, running with my knees out just a little bit. So one inch of space between my knees. So you can look at this guy, he's got one inch of space. This girl, she's crossing over, right? So I wanna think about this, having space. When I was, when I was um, really struggling with my knees and, and, and problems like that and wasn't really paying attention to it, I'd actually kind of clip my knees together a little bit. I actually almost touch them as I, as I ran and you don't, wanna, you don't want that to happen. Uh, I also will focus sometimes I'm running with good hip extension. So really concentrating on pulling the hip back or pulling my, my, my thigh back as well as um, think about when my foot's on the ground. So the foot is planted. Think about turning your foot out. You actually can't do it because the foot has all the weight on it. So you put your foot down and you try in your mind to turn it out and that will, that will have your glutes fire as you're running. But, and, I, and I'm, I know I'm preaching to the, to the choir here in that, um, you know, we all run, want to run with good technique. And these are all just little pieces of it. And uh, it was interesting. It was a Facebook post just a little while ago, Ron Gallagher had put up there uh, saying, you know, like running is a technical thing and it's a learned thing. We, if you want to be efficient and you want to be a good runner, you have to really be uh, a little bit cerebral with this. Um, I video myself running. And, you know, as you saw here, um, and, and actually look at it and see, you know, what I'm doing correct, what I'm, what I'm doing incorrect. Um, you know, I've looked at lots of people running and uh, made a little suggestions to them. But it's hard to change how you run to, when, you, when, you, when you really, you know, when you're really thinking about it. But um, it's amazing what ultimately happens is your body changes how you run. So if you're unstable in your hip, your body will compensate and it'll keep compensating and keep compensating and keep compensating until the point where you get injured and, or you're just going to be running slower and uh, you'll eventually will break down and 
you know, then you'll have to retrain yourself how to run anyways. So I always tell people, you know, it's better to learn to run properly and uh, to learn how to, you know, ultimately work with your glutes and have your glutes be your friend. And I think that all of us can be more successful if, uh, if we do that. That's the end of my presentation. I have some time if uh, some people have some questions. And John, I don't know if we had some uh, as, we, as we went. But. That, that, was, uh, that was great. Okay, so uh, talk about the band placement. We've got a couple uh, ideas on that. Uh, uh, below the knee, above the knee, and why that may influence the uh, glutes differently. Yeah, okay, so the glutes themselves, so, um, Think about your if you think about your legs like this, and they're in this plane. Okay, the glutes will do; they'll externally rotate your thighs, so they they will do this. Okay, if they're nice and strong, they'll be able to hold you steady when you run. But what happens when they're weak is your thighs turn in. So when when they're stable, they'll hold you here. Okay, so if you take that and you go all the way down to your feet, so now we're with our feet here. If my feet are turning out against resistance, so the band is coming across, they're turning out against resistance, they're actually helping that to basically stimulate the glutes to pull out this way, which is that better uh, position. If I put it around my ankles, this is the nice thing, it will keep my legs from doing, oh, sorry to get the background there, it's gonna kind of <laughs> keep my legs from doing this, which is also a good thing, okay? So they'll, they'll, they will, or sorry, they, they, yeah, they'll keep my legs from doing, no, they'll, they'll, so the band will pull in and my glutes will be activated to pull my, myself out like this. It's not a bad thing. It's just not the thing that I was, I was focusing on in that. Okay, so it's not wrong to put them around your ankle. Actually, the, the truth is, do some in your foot, some on your ankle. Those, it would all work. Um, I don't like doing it around my knees because if it's in my knees, oftentimes that'll bring that valgus knee It'll stimulate that, val that, that kind of that valgus knee position or that inner knee position. Mm. All right, that's great. So you, you talked about um, glute and hamstring. Yep. I did that VR this last weekend and it was a mile. Man, my hamstrings were so store, sore afterwards. Is that, do I, need to, I, do I need to start doing more glute work? Is it something going on with that? Or? Well, I, I actually would attribute that to something a little different. And <laughs> And, and, and the truth is mine were too, yeah. okay? And, but mine were actually sore from the 10K the week before. And you know, the, the, the truth is for me and maybe you as well, that's the first time I ran fast in a yeah. long time. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually think it was more of uh, probably taking a longer stride than we normally are taking mm -hmm. so fast at this time of year. Um, but that being said, that is a sign that you potentially have some glute weakness. Yeah. Um, but I actually think it's probably early season over striding that might be more of the issue. Because mm -hmm. if it was if it was happening all of the time, you know, you 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 potentially had like a hip um, or sorry a ham a chronic hamstring strain, then I would potentially look more to that. But uh, I, it may, it's probably a combination, honestly, of both. Yeah. So then how do we start looking for glute weakness? Is it something you said you videotape yourself? Is that something, you know, we should be doing like setting up a camera or? I, I actually love looking at race photos. Yeah, uh, okay. Especially the finish line, yeah. right? When they get you that, you know, the 10, 15 yards before the finish, maybe you're trying to go extra hard. That's when your form goes to, goes to, to hell, mm -hmm. as, as it were. Um, or they get you like 10 miles in, and you know you can see those and you can you can see so much in our in a race photo because i know it's hard to get out there and, and actually have someone video you or video yourself mm -hmm. um the best honestly is if you could have somebody ride their bike beside you and video you while you're running okay side be, front both okay and even back side front mm -hmm. back look for the crossover gate look for that the the knees coming in look for the the hips going up, you know, kind of up and down. Uh, those would all be signs. I will tell you this, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, you know, you know me, I race a lot. And when I do triathlon, uh, I actually, when I'm running in the race, I like to look at other people's form. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you'll be, it's amazing how poor people run uh, as far as triathletes 
And I think a lot of it, honestly, is from being in the time trial position for so long. Mm -hmm. And we're in that flex, flex, flex position. And our glutes are basically, think about it, your glutes are being stretched and worked as we're in, uh, in that time trial position for so long. So I, I, I think that all triathletes, honestly, could benefit uh, from doing this. And if you look at, um, if, you're, if you read much or read blogs, uh, of like top level pro triathletes and top level age groupers, they're doing a ton of this glute work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you, it used to be, okay, you know what? Uh, we got to spend all this time on our core. And what we found through the research is actually, it's more the backside of the core than the front side of the core. Mm -hmm. right? All the time, like doing crunches and sit-ups, it's probably not really doing a whole lot for us. It's, it's probably more about working on the glutes and spending spending the majority of your time uh doing that especially for triathlon and mm -hmm. the thing is is there's very little research on this you know john actually it might be an area we could look at one day is just you know glute strength and triathletes yeah. I, I could actually you know i did some some good high level searches i could find very very little on it and we look at runners and we don't necessarily see it mm -hmm. like as much as much as i think and i think because the the the, the posture they're in is potentially better than you know, spending hours and hours of, of biking and you know like most triathletes we spend most of our time training on the bike hmm. yeah so that was a question uh max actually asked earlier yeah. Rich jones he was asking with flora duffy does is that a track background background that she has or i don't know i actually i don't know either um i assume it has to be a track background because she runs so good yeah no that's great but if you but, it, but even if you just watch her and you know, and i suggest that everybody here goes and watches good runners as well and good triathlete runners you watching kipchoge yeah. is not doing anything for you because you cannot run like him mm -hmm. right he you just you can't like you look at uh, any of the top marathoners in the world or 10k runners in the world you can't run like that. Look at triathletes mm -hmm. running. Look at Patrick Lang. Yeah. I mean, he's a beautiful runner and he's running a 239 marathon. I mean, a 239 marathon in the real world. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. you're not, you're not even qualifying for the Olympic trials. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So, so, so then some of the, the things that you were talking about, they've got to be speed related. So, yes. you know, um, I often think sometimes when I run too slow, I'm actually at risk of some injuries and, and it's probably because I'm having a lot more hip drop or what do you think? Is that what? Um, I think it's interesting, right? Because I think slow running should still have a high cadence, mm -hmm. right? I think sometimes when we do slow running or when, when triathletes do like long, slow running, then they drop their cadence. And I think if you can run a slower pace with a higher cadence, so they're obviously shorter steps, it, and you, can, you potentially can maintain that stability a little bit more. Well, and I know from uh, our research on cadence, you're stiffer in the lower extremity when you go with a higher cadence, so they're probably but, right in line with everything. But the stiffness is a good thing. Yeah, right, right, right. That, that's what I mean is that probably right in line with your, with yeah. your line of thinking. Yeah, that's, and once again, very little research on that in triathletes, right? Um, I, I find it really interesting. Uh, I don't know about you, John, but when I get off the bike and I want to start running, I feel really stiff, right? Mm -hmm. And it takes, you know, a couple of miles to do that, to get to where I'm feeling comfortable. I'm wondering if that stiffness is actually a good thing. Yeah. No, that's true. You, and I don't know. Yeah. So, let, let, well, let me go in that same direction then. You know, this last season, it seemed like a lot of pro triathletes were having sacral stress fractures. Uh -huh. Is that the flip end of this, of being too weak? Now, maybe you've got something too strong or they overdid these types of exercises. So it's interesting, right? When we look at these guys, it was mostly guys that had sacral uh, stress fractures. There's a lot to play in a sacral stress fracture. If I were working with them and the first thing I would say is nutrition, mm -hmm. right? Are they actually getting proper nutrition? Because you look at them uh, when um, Ferdino had his. Yeah. It was the leanest I'd ever seen him in that world championship right before it happened, right? Um, was it Lionel Sanders that had it as well? 
Uh, Lion Sanders, yep, he was one. Same thing. He lost a ton of weight. He did. Before, yeah. mm -hmm. Right? So we look at stress fractures often as, oh, you know, they were, they were training too much. And that's partly it. But I actually think it's, we see more stress fractures from lack of good nutrition and lack of calories than anything else. And when we talk about lack of calorie, and this is a whole nother talk, but um, we look at hormonal imbalances that are associated with those things. So, you know, were they on the cusp of having um, uh, relative energy def de deficiency syndrome or REDS? Um, and I would say potentially yes. But I don't know. I, I don't. I didn't see any of their files, um, but I think that that is potentially more of it. And then both of them, when they had it, were running some of the fastest they've ever ran. Right. Yeah. So it's an interesting point, right? So how did they get so fast? What were they ultimately doing? Um, I mean, I don't. I don't think that that it, it's a stability issue. I think honestly, it was probably more dietary. Hmm. Interesting. Huh? If, I was, if I was to guess. Yeah. No, that's great. So then I haven't been doing this. And okay. I think there's a lot of people listening to this aren't doing this. How do I get started? Yeah. So I think, honestly, if I was to get started with this, I would pick one or two of these exercises and just do it as part of your warm up. And actually, that's the other thing I'll talk about is the warm up. So a few, was it last year we did the swim warm up, uh, did the bands for people and five or six people came out and it was great. And we did some, a bunch of band work and everyone's like, oh, I don't warm up. And I think that's another mistake that adult athletes in particular make is we really do need to warm up. And the warm up, in my opinion, and the research points this, it's not nearly as effective to just run slow to warm up to run, right? We need to actually, put, it's, called, it's called potentiation. We need to actually potentiate that's a big word. We need to basically get the muscles firing properly and ready for the session. Um, it is one of my, and I hope some of the people from my master swim group are listening. It's one of my biggest pet peeves is I'm the only person on the deck with my bands and I do it all the time. Before I get in a swim, it's 10 minutes of band work to warm up. I will not run unless I spend at least 10 minutes doing specific things, exercises to warm up. And a lot of them are glutes, but they're not, I don't do just glute stuff. I do some stuff for my hamstrings. I do some stuff for my calves. You know, I want to prepare myself and you know, it's the same with racing. I, I try unless not always for an, for uh, like a full Ironman or a half Ironman. Cause I think that, you know, the warm up might be actually sapping some of my energy, but for a shorter race, I'm warming up. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, think it's, I think it's a really important part of, of doing this. So just pick one or two of these exercises, start, start actually doing a warm up, and pick you know, one or two of these. Um, and then like I said, halfway through your run, stop, do a couple sets of 10, of just pick any of these exercises and just see how you feel. Um, the only thing that happens to me is when I do that, I instantly run better the second half. Mm -hmm. Like it just, it, it literally, it wakes you up and not mentally, but it wakes your legs up to something different. And, you know, it, it's amazing. My, my second half of my runs since I started doing this have just been so much better. And, you, and, and, I, and, I, and I promise you, you'll feel better. And I know, I'm going to add this to you. I know runners hate to stop running, right? Oh my gosh, I got a, I got a red light. I got to stop at it. Oh, I'm jogging in place because, okay. But if you think about it, when we swim, we stop all the time. Go to a pool workout, right? Do, do people swim for an hour straight? I know, John, you do. <laughs> but in general, people, you know, they do their 200. They stop, right? They rest for 10 seconds. They do another 200. They stop. They rest for 20 seconds. It's okay to stop when you run and actually do something purposeful, right? Uh, well, I do this on my bike, I'll, especially when I'm home, uh, riding on the trainer. After an hour, I always try and get up, do some, do some hip activation exercises, do a little stretch, jump back on. And I've noticed once I started doing that, I fatigue less easily on the bike. Right? It's harder to do out on the road. I'm going to be completely honest with you on your bike. But when I'm training indoors, I, 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 I do it. No, that's great. And, you know, we are, you know, coming from a swim background myself, we're so you know, it's so ingrained to work on technique and do drills. 
but we just don't carry that over to running or cycling for that matter. So this is, this is great. And, and, and I would even consider these running drills. Like, you know, you know what I mean? Like there's, there's books and books on running drills. Um, I guess these are, you know, helping with running, but um, it's not your typical, you know, your typical run drills for sure. It's thinking about it maybe from a different way from, you know, we're building kind of from the ground up. Well, this has been great. We've been going for an hour. I know that we, you and I can continue to talk about this. This is fantastic. Uh, I'm going to uh, stop the recording now. Okay. We'll post this link uh, later on for people to watch it as well. So I'm going to hit stop recording.